So we've been in a 12-week series of the Trinity, and tonight we're on session number seven. So we're about halfway through the Trinity. It's 12 weeks, so we're starting the second half of the 12 weeks with session seven tonight. In session one, we looked at why the Trinity mattered, and just kind of like a one-sentence summary. It matters because, number one, it's biblical, and number two, without understanding, partly at least, the Trinity, many of the other doctrines of Orthodox Christianity don't make a lot of sense. So the Trinity is important in how we understand other doctrines within the Christian faith. In session two, we looked at some false views of the Trinity, which kind of broke down to those that were misunderstandings of the biblical background for the Trinity or those that were based on analogies that didn't really fit the Trinity, doesn't explain it totally. In session three, we looked at the oneness of God. Old and New Testament both has multiple verses in it that talk about there is one God or God is one. Uh, we looked at Old and New Testament uh, verses that supported that. In session four, we looked at an overview of the three persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In session five, we looked at God's role as God the Father. We looked at his divinity, verses in Old and New Testament that proclaim God to be divine, not human, uh, that he is a spirit and is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth, if you remember some of Jesus' sayings in the Gospels. We also looked at his fatherhood as it relates to God the Son, to Israel, and to the church. Then last week was session six, and we looked at God's role as God the Son. And again, we looked at the um, deity of Christ. We looked at Old and New Testament verses that proclaim that Christ is in fact God. And then tonight we're going to look at God, Jesus as the God man, as our author taught, calls it. Basically, we're looking at the incarnation. <clears throat> so we're going to start. So, those of you with your Bibles, let's flip to Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to look at some other verses, but Philippians chapter 2, we're going to come back to a couple of times. So keep your finger there when we look at other verses because it'll get mentioned a couple of times. Did you say Philippians chapter Philippians 2? chapter 2. Beginning in verse 8, or excuse me, verse 5, and running through verse 8. What we're going to look at tonight is how Jesus can be both God and man. And throughout church history, this has been a hotly debated topic. Towards the end of the session today, we're going to very briefly touch on a number of heresies of the early church that either denied that Jesus was fully human or denied that he was fully deity. Some of those um, heresies are still prevalent today. We talked about them a few times before with Jehovah's Witness and also looking at uh, Islam and Judaism, which are some of the other monotheistic religions that don't view Christ as both God and man. They either acknowledge that he was a good person, a messenger sent from God, or he was a created being, which is what the Jehovah Witnesses <clears throat> would tell you. But how can he be both? What does the scriptures have to say about how God the Son came to earth and added, that's an important word, added to his deity, humanity. 
Because when you look in the story of his ministry in the New Testament, you see places where Jesus displays his deity. And we talked about that last week when we talked about God the Son. You see him um, forgiving sins. You see him accepting worship. You see him controlling nature. The things that you would expect from a God. But you also see him being hungry, being tired, being thirsty. The things that you would expect from a human. So how can he be both? That's what we're going to look at tonight. So let's start by looking at these first verses in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. So Janice, would you read from yours, please? <clears throat> Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature... God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Okay. The Apostle Paul here in Philippians and in many of his other epistles, confronted head-on the early heresies that disputed that Christ was both God and man. And here's one example. And we're, As you know, I like word studies, so we're going to do some word studies here. So if you look at the beginning of these verses in verse 6, He's talking about Christ Jesus, and he says here, who existing in the form of God. Now, it's very important. Like I, say, I like word studies, because when you go look at the, the Greek, you get more from it than what we get in the English. When they're talking about form here, I think I mentioned last week, there are two different Greek words that deal with form. One is the word from which we get more metamorphosis, or morphing, changing your external appearance. The other word is the word that is used here that talks about the inner essence of something. And what Paul is saying here in verse 6 is that Christ existing in the form of God, in other words, his inner nature did not change. He is still God, even though later he says... He took the form of man. So Paul is addressing the heresies that say that he's one or the other. He can't be both. So what he's saying here again is that while he came to earth as a man, his inner essence as God the Son did not change. Then he goes on to say that he did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. When Christ came to earth, he did not give up his deity. I think I may have mentioned that last week when we were looking at God the Son. Just because he came to earth and took the outward form of a man, that word morph, which talks about the outward appearance, he took the outward appearance of a man, but he did not give up the fact that he was God the Son. In verse 7 it says, Instead he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. When he talks about emptying himself, the Greek word means to pour out or to... Um, give of himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. And that is a very important point to think about for a minute. 
because only a man could die. When Christ came to earth, he took the form of a man, so the outward appearance of a man, but the inward appearance, the inward essence, remained deity. He voluntarily, and we'll get into this a little bit later, he voluntarily gave up or did not manifest some of his divine attributes by his choice and only used them in certain times. For instance, when he controlled nature. He was acting as God at that point. But in the temptation, if you remember, one of the temptations from the devil was turn these stones to bread. And he refused to do it. Well, after 40 days of uh, starvation, he was probably hungry. He could have very easily done a divine act and turned the stones to bread. But he didn't do that. He voluntarily did not act as a deity he acted as a human at that point. The idea that Christ is both God and man is an absolute central tenet of the Christian faith. Without it, we have all kinds of problems. In John chapter 1, verse 14... The Apostle John says, The Word, and the Word refers to Christ, The Word became flesh and took up residence among us. The word there, when he talks about took up residence, simply is a simplified way of stating that the divine took on <clears throat> the human form. Jesus became the only person in human history to have two natures. He had a divine nature and he had a human nature. Unlike some of the heresies that said that he had one or the other or one was subordinate to the other or there was some kind of mixture of the two, the simple truth is he had two equally important natures. One divine and without it being divine, he could not be the Messiah. Remember last week we talked about a number of verses that identified the Messiah as divine. Particularly when we looked in Isaiah, I think it was, the Christmas session that we looked at. So without the fact that he was divine, he couldn't have been the Messiah. But more importantly, without being fully human... He couldn't be the Savior. He couldn't be the perfect man who died on the cross to justify the rest of humanity with God the Father. As Christianity spread across the world in those first three or four hundred years, this became a central issue among different early church leaders where they, I hate to say fault, but they debated over what does it mean to be both? In fact, in one of the earliest church statements about the doctrine of the Incarnation, in 451 A.D., the Creed of Chalcedon said this in part, We all with one voice confess our Lord Jesus Christ to be one and the same Son, perfect in divinity and humanity, truly God and truly human, consisting of a rational soul and a body, being one substance with the Father in relation to his divinity, and being one being, and being of one substance with us in relation to his humanity, and is like us in all things apart from sin. Now, why did they have to, to address that within the first 400 years or so of the early church? Because by this time, there had already been a half dozen or more heresies that said that this wasn't what it was. He was either man, or he was divine, or he was a mix or both, or he only appeared to be such and such. I'll talk about a few of those later on. 
But it was enough of an issue that one of the ch earliest church creeds had to address it. Now, there's two words on your worksheet, your note-taking sheet, that I like to call them the theological terms that we don't hear a whole lot. But if you're a theologian, and the guy who wrote this book is a theologian, believe me, um, they kind of help explain what they're talking about when they talk about the Incarnation. So the first one is something called the hypostatic union. That's a theological term. What it means is, the word hypostatic, when you translate it, means person. And it simply means that Christ as the person of Jesus Christ, as I said a few minutes ago, had two natures. One fully human, one fully divine, all in one person. He was with God the Father fully. He was part of the triune Godhead. But he was also fully man and experienced everything that humanity experiences as we go through life. They were perfectly united in one person. Not mixing, not subordinate to one or the other. They were in union, equal and displayed however Jesus Christ needed to display them during his time on earth. The other word, not a theological word, is the word kenosis. And again, I think that's on your sheet. Um, kenosis is the Greek term there in verse 7 where it talks about him emptying himself. The word that is translated there, emptied himself, is the word kenosis. And that word can have various interpretations. One prominent one, at least in the early days of the church, and even today in some offshoots of Christianity and other religions, um, the interpretation is that in order for Jesus to be human when he came to earth, he had to give up being divine. Well, I've already said he kept the two natures, so we can kind of discard that interpretation. The more biblical one that is held by most biblical scholars is that, again, as I said before, when he came to earth, he was both human and divine. But at times, he exercised one or the other of his natures. At times, he exercised his human nature. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He cried. If you remember at Lazarus's tomb, he cried. At other times, he exercised his divine nature. Controlled the storm on the sea, raised people from the dead, so forth. When he came to earth, Jesus did not surrender his divine power. He simply surrendered his divine glory. He was not as God in heaven with all the glory of heaven around him. He surrendered the glory, but not the power. He could do whatever he wanted, whatever he voluntarily decided to do in either nature. And I may not be saying this exactly like what's written on your sheet, but we'll come back to the sheet like we always do and make sure you get it filled in. Good. The author of our book quotes a guy by the name of Kenneth St Samples, Kenneth Samples, who wrote a book called God Among Sages. And Mr. Sa Samples lists ten things that he called the Ten Truths to Better Understanding the Person and Work of Jesus. In other words, how to better understand the fact that he was both God and man. And some of them, they just kind of flow into each other. He lists them as ten separate things. But honestly, they just kind of flow one into the other. You don't need to copy them down. They're not, I don't think they're on your sheet. 
but they kind of emphasize everything that I've said up until this point. So his first truth is that Jesus Christ is one person possessing two distinct natures, one completely divine nature and one completely human nature. I've said that three or four times already. The second thing he says as a truth is that Christ is the same person both before and after the Incarnation. Prior to the Incarnation, Jesus had one nature. He was God. We talked about that last week. We talked about God the Son. Prior to him being born in Bethlehem, he was God the Son. He had a divine nature. When he came to earth, he added to that divine nature a human nature. But they exist together. One doesn't supplant the other. They exist simultaneously, and he's able to exercise, while he was on earth, either of the two natures that he wanted. Through his divine nature, we talked about this last week, he is God the Son. He's fully divine, just like God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. In his human nature, he displays everything that we do. He got hungry, he got thirsty, he got tired. He retains all attributes of both natures. But it is a true and personal union. As I said a few minutes ago, he's the only person in history who actually had two separate natures in one person. One divine and one human. They are a perfect complementary union. One doesn't supplant the other. One doesn't... Um, take precedence over the other. The human nature is not deified and the divine nature is not humified, if that's a word. Again, they don't supplant one or the other. They exist as a complement to each other. But they are inseparable, they are unmixed, and they are unchanged. So, get ready to write. This is on your sheet. We think it's at the top of the second page on the back. We're going to look at some passages in the New Testament that kind of talks about the Incarnation and what it means. So, the first one I read a few minutes ago. That's uh, John 1, 14. John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh and took up residence among us. That's the important part. Because the word translated as took up residence, or if you have an NIV, it may say dwelt among us, or some other version may say dwelt among us. Holman says took up residence. What it means is when you look at the original Greek, it's talking about God's presence in the tabernacle. I think we talked about this last week. In the tabernacle and in the temple. And then once he left and the Holy Spirit came, he resides in all believers. Romans 1, 3 to 4. Romans 1, 3 to 4. The Apostle Paul says the following. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh. Humanity. He came from a human lineage. David. That's where the Messiah was going to come from. So Paul is talking about his human nature at this point. So was Mary the descendant from David? I've heard varying things whether it was Mary or Joseph. But Joseph wasn't his father. Wasn't his father, but he was his father on earth. I have heard in a number of other places, I couldn't quote you right offhand, that Mary was in fact a descendant of David, but I can't prove that. I don't know. I've never seen anything definitive on that one. 
But if you look at the genealogy, in Matthew, Matthew 1.16, when it talks about Jesus as meant, um, talks about Jacob followed Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Which, to me, lends it that this, the lineage came through Mary. It's the way I would read that verse. But that's me talking, not any theologian that I've read. It make more sense. It, to me, it makes more sense, yes. Um, and Matthew was very precise on his lineage. I think... Okay, I don't remember. Here's another another lineage given somewhere else, and I don't remember right now where it is, but I just go back to the one at Matthew. It seems to me to indicate that, that the lineage came through Mary. But that's me talking, and that's not a commentary or something I've read somewhere else. And I could be wrong. But it, like you said, it makes more sense that way. Uh, then he goes on to say, uh, It's the descendant of David according to the flesh, and was established as the powerful Son of God, that's his divinity, by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness. So in Romans, Paul says Jesus is human because he came from the lineage of David. He came from a human lineage. But because of the resurrection, that's the sign of his divinity. In Romans 9, 5, Paul again addresses this uh, issue, and he says, The forefathers are theirs, and from them by physical descent came the Messiah. So forefathers would be the forefathers of the Israelites. So the forefathers from them by physical descent, from human descent, came the Messiah, who is God over all. There's his divinity. What? That's Romans 9, 5? Romans 9, 5. Uh-huh. That's not what mine says. Well, the wording in my Bible is kind of a little bit different. But Mine's a lot Latin different. Says, and he is God, the one who rules over everything, is worthy, worthy of eternal praise. And that's, that's, it, that's amen, but there's a bunch before that. Yeah. You got the tail end of the verse. Yes, so, but, that, but you, you got, got the verse. <laughs> you got the verse. Let me read the beginning. Yeah, I'll read the whole thing in yours. Okay. Nine five. Okay. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors, and Christ Himself was an Israelite as far as His human nature is concerned, and He is God, the One who rules rules over everything, and is worthy of eternal praise. Okay. Amen. Are you reading from the Amplified Version? What's your version? Because it sounds like an Amplified. It's a, it's a study Bible. Okay. New Living Test. Yours is a study Bible and it expands some of the words. That's why yours is so much longer than mine. But you got you got actually more than what mine says. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you, you actually added some clarity to it because you listed the forebearers. Mine just says forebearers. Mine says patriarchs. Patriarchs. Once you listed and the Amplified says something on what it yeah. says. Theirs. No, 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 no. So then Philippians 5, 5 to 7, which we already looked at, that's what we started with, is an early church hymn. And I've already talked about how each of those parts talk about him being, you know, human and man. But Paul goes on, Colossians 2, 9. Colossians 2, 9 says... For in him dwells the fullness of God's nature bodily, and you have been filled with him. Yeah, and you have been filled with him who is the head over every ruler and authority. Again, his, two, nine. two nine. Again, his divinity is mentioned. And I won't read it, but in first John four two, the apostle John again addresses the heresy that Jesus is not divine and basically makes it a test for orthodoxy. So like I said, there are just a few of the verses that we 
can find in the Bible that talks about Jesus being both human and divine. But that did not keep people from disputing it. So here are a whole bunch of heresies. Just kind of sit back and listen to them, and I'll tell you the one that's important that's on your sheet. And that's the first one. And that is something called Docetism, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M, which was an early form of Gnosticism. And I think Gnosticism is the word you're supposed to fill in. It's, where are you? Yeah, where are you? I'm Hi. on that last last Hi. question Hi. on your sheet. Oh, oh okay. A number of... Okay. Okay. And the first one, the first heresy was Docetism, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M, which is an early form of Gnosticism. I'll get to plain English in a minute. Gnosticism is K-N-O-S, no, excuse me, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. A Gnostic was one who basically said the world is made up of two things. It's made up of material things, and that's bad. And it's made up of spiritual things, and that's good. You want to spell this G word again? G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. Thank you, because I was wondering about it too. <laughs> Marilyn, I figured we needed it clarified. <laughs> yeah. The Gnostic heresy basically said that there is a dualism, like the Gnostics in general said, between matter and spirit. And according to the Gnostics, according to this Gnosticism, dos the idea was that Christ really wasn't human. He was just a figment of your imagination. Is that what we're supposed to put here? No. I'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, he was not human. He just appeared to be human. Because if he had been human, according to their beliefs, he would have been material, which would have been bad, would have been evil. So therefore, he wasn't human. He was only divine, and we observed him as human. People could touch him. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't say it was right. I, <laughs> it was just a belief that the early church fought with. And in fact, uh, Apostle John, in that First John 4 verses, where he makes the idea that Christ is divine and human as a test for orthodoxy, it's the reason he put it in there. Because these folks were very prevalent in the early church. There was a Jewish sect, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it, that basically said Jesus was just human. He was a good man, he was a prophet, but he was just human. Is that that last sentence on this page? That uh, I don't remember. I'll come back to it. I'll go five. through them. Yeah. I don't <laughs> remember. I just remember Gnosticism as being the first part of it. Uh, there's another one called Arianism which is kind of what the Jehovah Witnesses follow today, and that's the idea that Christ was a created being. And we've talked about that several times before. And there are honestly a whole bunch of other ones, and I'm not going to bore you with all of them, because they basically come down to one of two ideas. They either said that Christ was just divine and what we thought was human was really just a figment of our imagination. Or he was just human and there was no divinity. That's what all the heresies came down to. Denying one of the two natures of Christ. Which, as I said at the beginning, kind of takes our Orthodox Christian belief of him being both and turns it on his head. While Jesus shares all of the divine attributes of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, he is the only member of the triune Godhead who has taken on human flesh. And why did he have to take on human flesh? Because in order to satisfy the triune God's plan for redemption, there needed to be a human who fully met God's requirements could meet every jot and tittle of the law. If 
you remember Jesus said not one jot or one tittle will be removed from the law until it's all fulfilled. He was the only one who could fulfill it. That's why he had to become a human. He could identify with fallen humanity because he had been tempted, and he could fulfill the law and be the ultimate payment for humanity's sin and justification before God the Father. And by his death and burial, he physically rose from the grave. And some of the verses we've talked about on Sunday mornings before, he now um, sits in heaven where he is our mediator between us and God the Father. Until the day that God the Father says, okay, son, it's time you go back to earth to get your church. We talked about the bride of church on Sunday, the bride Church has the bride on Sunday. It's time to go back and get your church and to judge the world for their sin and establish our kingdom. Until then, Christ is the God-man. He's both God in heaven and he's also God with us. Okay, let's look at the notes. And I know... I'm bad at this. I'm sorry. I don't remember how I wrote some of these. But here's what the answers are to your cheat sheet. Good. <laughs> My cheat sheet quotes from the book, and I don't always quote from the book the way he quotes it. So number one says, the Bible is clear that Jesus is the God man. That is, 2,000 years ago, the eternal Son of God added sinless humanity. humanity to his deity through the, starts with a V, virgin. virgin birth, and thus became the only person in history with two natures. Divine, Divine and human. Divine and human. This is what the incarnation means. Number two says, the importance of the incarnation should not be overlooked. If Jesus is not divine, he cannot be the... Son of God. Messiah or oh. Christ. If he's not human, he cannot be our Savior. Savior. Got that. This truth sets Christianity apart from all other religions of the world, including the monist, monotheistic faiths of Judaism and Islam. I mean, usually when we talk about other monolithic, monotheistic faiths, it's Judaism and Islam. Two terms are sometimes used to help us better understand the Incarnation. Hypostatic union refers to the union of Jesus' two distinct natures. natures. Got more than you thought you did. In one person, without dividing the persons or confounding his natures. Christ is one in substance with the... Starts with an F. Father. Father, in regard to his divine nature. So Christ is... Divine Nessus is the same as God the Father. And one in substance with, starts Huma with an H, humanity. humanity in regard to his human nature. Kenosis refers to the manner in which Jesus emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant taking on the, this is a direct quote from the scripture, being. Uh, likeness of men. Likeness. That is, instead of stripping himself of his divine attributes, Jesus retained them in his divine, starts with an N, nature. nature. But in union with his human nature, he may have voluntarily chosen not to exercise or use certain attributes of his deity. Put another way, Jesus surrendered his divine glory, but not his divine power. Okay, number four on the back. The Word became flesh. flesh and took up residence among us. B says, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was a descendant of David, David according to the flesh, and was established as the powerful Son, Son of God by the resurrection. resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of Holiness. The forefathers are theirs, and from them, by physical descent, came the Messiah, who is 
God. God over all, bless forever. Amen. Get the next two. Philippians, make your own attitude that of Jesus Christ, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he starts with an E. Emptied, emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. Uh, Colossians, for in him the entire fullness of God's nature, nature dwells bodily. And I didn't read the first John one, but it says, this is how you know the spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And the Apostle John, in his letter, makes this a test of Orthodox Christianity. Because he was refuting the docetistics. You said he was just appeared to be human. That's a mouthful. Number five, a number of heretical views about Jesus has plagued the church throughout history. Among those false views is docetism, an early form of Gnosticism, which advances a type of dualism expressing the belief that spirit is good and divine. No, matter, matter is evil. <laughs> spirit is good, matter is even evil. They argue that Jesus only appeared to be human because if he had been really human, he would have been evil because he would have been matter. Okay. There's no big words. This is one of the easy ones with words. Okay. Questions, comments, whatever. You know I've got a question. I was going to say, I'm looking right at you, Paul. <laughs> Uh, the divinity, did that happen at birth, or did it happen when, after he was baptized by John the Baptist? The divinity? I mean... The, the humanity the, part happened at birth. Yeah. Yeah. But but I we mean, go back to what we talked about last divine, week in God the Son. God has, God the Son, Jesus Christ, has always been divine. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, as the triune Godhead, have always been divine. From birth on. Yeah, they from, were never born. From before time. They were before time forever. They yeah. they didn't have a birth. But when he was born, I think this is a question you've got. When he was born in Bethlehem, that's when he added humanity to his divinity and became human and divine. Was at birth. At birth. Okay. At birth. I just wondered because I know that when he was baptized by John the Baptist, he says, you know, you acknowledge your son and he's mm -hmm. all pleased with him. And the question, you can almost, and I'm not going to do it, you can <laughs> almost get into a debate over, is he saying at that point, I'm pleased with him in his divine nature, or I'm pleased with him in his human nature, or my interpretation, he's, he's pleased, pleased with him with both. He's just period. He, he's just period, and happy yeah. with him both ways. Well, Beth? And as I understand it, okay, so he's, he's always divine, but he was human, but by being having his divinity he didn't have to go through all he went through no at any point in time when they were beating him and mm -hmm. doing all this stuff go back to the temptation said, i've had all this i want i'm coming home dad you know mm -hmm. i mean that's a little dumb. Well, but so and i don't know that, it, that our brains can even encompass that i mine can't mm -hmm. but you know I, I will give you a, a little is, synopsis he's, he's totally short synopsis divine. okay <laughs> Because we're going to get into this later yeah. on when we get into the Trinity and salvation. But according to our author in the commentaries and stuff that I've read, you know, if we consider God, and when I say God, I mean the tri Trinity, the triune mm -hmm. Godhead, mm -hmm. knew from the beginning that man wasn't going to make it. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning, they had a plan mm -hmm. of how they're going to redeem him. And the Father was going to provide the grace. The Son was going to be the sacrifice, and the Holy Spirit was going to be one that drew it to him. And each one of them voluntarily took their part in the plan. And in on his human essence, it's like Garden of Gethsemane. Don't let this happen to me. In the divine plan, this has got to happen because this is what we all said had to happen. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay. And he said, okay, he went through it. Because that was the plan. Right. From creation, but it showed his human side when it, he said, it "Showed his if there's his any human way, if there's any way you through. can take this away, and I don't have to do this." Yeah. 
And that, that's a real it. short condensation because yeah. we're going to have a whole session on yeah, Trinity no, and salvation. I, I didn't want to get. But that's a well, short, they, short just, synopsis. Hmm. Anybody else? Shirley. It also shows that he willingly became the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Romans did not kill him. He mm -hmm. gave no. his life. He could have barely said he could have. Well, I think there's a verse somewhere that says I, you could. No, it's in the temptation. He can call ten thousand angels. Right. That would have taken care of a lot of stuff. He didn't have to go through. But he didn't do it. He stuck with the plan. Part of the mystery of the Trinity for me is thinking that Jesus has always existed. The Trinity has always existed. It's kind of uh, easy for us to think when well, Jesus began 2,000 years ago mm -hmm. with his birth. But no, as you brought out so many times, eternal from, you can't say the very beginning because we believe there is no belief beginning. Always, yeah. But it's been Jesus and the Father and the Spirit forever. Forever, yeah. yeah. But However long he is. became human. Right. The incarnation occurred right. at birth. Yeah. Which he volunteered for. Which he volunteered. That was his part of the plan that they developed. Okay. Dean, would you close this in prayer? Sure. Father, I would just uh, thank you again for uh, James preparing and, and teaching us about Trinity and bringing it to light to us. And, Thank you for the discussion that we've had tonight about uh, your perfect will for us and uh, you giving yourself and being a part of that plan that we might be able to uh, return to God and be with him at his side. So we thank you for that and uh, just pray that you will be with each one now as we depart here and bring us back next week and be with those that... Uh, weren't here tonight and just bless them and keep them safe and uh, return them to us also. Amen. So next week is the Holy Spirit is God.